Hi, this is Brandon with an introduction to Substance Painter for Beginners. Today we're going to look at the UI and some best practices. We're also going to be using a hand-painted style on this project. That means no smart materials, and for the final project we will only export out a diffuse texture, also known as a base color map. So to get started in Substance Painter, similar to Photoshop, we'll go to File, New. Now there's three things in this area I like to work with. The first thing we'll do is pick a template. PBR, Metallic Roughness, is a good place to start. We need to find our file location. I previously set up a folder with the FBX export from Maya. I've got another video about how to export an FBX. The link is in the description. So we'll select our FBX file, open. And the third thing I do is document resolution. I will start at 2K. This can be adjusted later on export. Everything else, I just leave default. Hit OK. Now this will bring up our model in two views. We have our 3D view of our object, and then we have our UV layout. It's extremely important to have a good UV layout before even starting in Substance Painter. If you do need to make adjustments in your model and re-export into Substance Painter, if you've only made minor adjustments, you'll be okay. But if you add too many changes, Substance Painter does not like that, and a lot of your work can be lost in the painting you've already done. All right, so to take a quick look around the interface. The Assets panel starts up here on the left. I like it down in the bottom. Just drag it and dock it down here and you can dock any panel you like. You can move them around as you, as you like. And for a hand-painted project like this one, I will just skip right to the brush panel. Over here on the left, we have the texture set list. This is showing M underscore dagger as my main shader. This means I only have one material attached to the entire model, which is exactly what I want. Now, if I have multiple materials here, this will export out multiple textures. Working with a stylized look, I don't need any other materials. Down below, we have the layers panel. We'll get into this more here in just a moment. Under the Texture Set Settings tab, here I can change the view resolution of my model. So if I were to bring this down to a 512, it's going to make the texture look as if it was a 512 texture. Again, I typically work in 2K. If I were to push it up to 4K, most computers would chug pretty hard. Some even have a hard time with 2K depending on your machine. So if you find that you're painting really slowly, bump it down to 1024. Below that, we have our color channels. If I need to add anything else in a project, I would add it here. For this type of project, I don't need to. Now scrolling down, I can bake my mesh maps here. I can also bake them up here with this icon. Within this interface, this shows me how to actually bake my model. Now I don't necessarily need to bake my model for what I'm doing. I'm doing a hand-painted style. And the reason you'd want to bake your mesh maps is if you're using any kind of a smart material, or if you're projecting anything onto it with a generator, if you want to like gen procedurally generate some dirt or things like that. To go over this quickly, I would change the output size to 4K. I would rather bake the maps in a higher resolution and not need it later. That way it's already baked and it's good to go. If I had a high poly model that I wanted to bake down to a low poly model, I would go ahead and add that here. However, I'm just going to bake the model onto itself. So I'm going to use low poly mesh as the high poly mesh. On the cage itself, we can change the distances here. I would either leave this where it's at or maybe upscale it to 0.03. I would not go much further than that. It, uh, it really kind of messes up your bake if you do. Going down below, I can change the anti-aliasing. This will increase the time it takes to render, but it will also give a sharper render. Match either always or by mesh name. If you're doing a high to low bake, you can name each piece in Maya as you export it out and you can match by the mesh name. So it will only bake things to that specific piece or with always, it will just bake to everything. Again, I'm just gonna leave this default for now. In your 3D software, you need to name each piece with underscore low and underscore high within each high and low model in order for it to, to work with by mesh name. Okay, as far as the actual maps that we are baking, typically you'll want a normal, world space normal. I usually don't use ID, that's a different workflow. I'll meet occlusion, curvature, position, thickness are all very important. And then we will bake the selected texture. This can take a few minutes, so this might be a time to get up, use the bathroom, grab a coffee. All right, once the textures have been baked, return to painting mode. Now you can see in the texture set settings, these maps have been baked out. Now the other thing I like to do is I like to add this display settings tab over here. This can be found under Windows, Views, Display Settings, and then I just dock it right over here. The biggest reason I like the Display Settings tab over here, if I scroll way down to almost the very bottom, I can show the mesh wireframe with this toggle box. This can be very, very helpful 
because without it, I can't actually see where the geometry is. If I have anything where I want something to follow any of these edge loops or get a better view of my geometry, I will toggle this on and off. We'll leave this off for now. Go back to the Layers tab. I also like to go and change my camera view to orthographic. That gives me a little bit better perspective on what I'm looking at. Also, while turning my model with Alt and left click, I can also use Shift to snap to these different orthographic views. This comes in very, very handy when I want to paint something flat across the model. All right, as far as bringing in a reference, I like to use PureRef. PureRef is a separate independent software. I'll have some more information in the description. But the reason that I like the software so much, it can display images over another software and stay floating on top. This is really, really nice because if I were to just show this in a Windows default image viewer, I'd have to scoop my Substance Painter window over and have it sitting next to it. I can bring this in, just set it right on top, use right mouse to move it around, left mouse to move the actual image. I can zoom, I can do all kinds of things. I'll have some more information down in the description below. All right, the next thing I will do is start building up these layers over here. I'm going to start with adding a fill layer. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a black mask to this. Adding a black mask is a pretty staple way to work in a non-destructive workflow. It is possible to work on one layer and continuously be color dropping and painting your model. However, I like the non-destructive nature of being able to work within several layers and add a different color to each layer. I can paint within that mask, add generators, paint layers, fill layers, all kinds of other things over here. It's a pretty good workflow. The next thing I'll do is click on the actual color layer itself, go down to the properties, I'm going to disable all of these other color channels that I don't need. I'm not going to use height, roughness, metal, normal. This cleans things up a little bit. It's better for the file size and for general organization. Okay, so now I will click on the color layer, go down to this little eyedropper. One of my favorite things about Substance Painter is this eyedropper will translate to other softwares, other windows, other areas. So I can eyedropper from another program, which is really, really, really helpful. Now I'm gonna start with just grabbing kind of a base color of this blade. I don't wanna get my highlights, I don't wanna get my darks. I wanna get something in the middle. So let's say, let's go, so let's go down over here. I'm going to double click on this to rename the layer. Now what I can do is duplicate this layer with Control D and I can go in and select another area. The nice thing about this is that all of my presets are already here. I've already got the black mask and I've already got these turned off. That way, as I go in and duplicate every layer and build up from there, I don't have to go and uncheck everything. It saves me a little bit of time. So now I'm going to go and find the dark part of my blade. Let's go, let's get some of the shadows in here. Okay, now I can always change these layers if I need to. I like to get the layers named, set up with the basic colors that I'm going to need. All right, there's my dark layer. Again, Control D. Color pick. Now I typically like to work with the darks below and the highlights on top. And that's how I will usually paint. So I will start at the bottom, work my way up, adding highlights to each little section I've done. And once I've got all these kind of base colors set up. It's really nice because I've already got the layer there. I know what to work with. I know what I'm doing. And this kind of starts to guide my process from here. So I will just look at what colors I'm going to be using. And I can always add more if I need to later. But this just gives me a direction to start. Now over here on the far left, I have the paint tool. I have an eraser tool. I have the paint along path tool, which is a new addition to Substance Painter. I have a polygon fill tool. Now the polygon fill is an extremely useful tool. So go ahead and select that. And down over here in the properties, when I have my black mask selected, the fill mode, I can either do individual triangles, individual polygons, a mesh fill, which is an entire mesh, or if I go to the UV chunk fill and the color selection is set to white, it will now select the entire UV chunk and fill it with the color on that layer. So I can just mark you select across the blade and it fills that entire UV chunk. This is opposed to if I were to do just the polygon fill, it would actually only select individual polygons at a time, which is also very, very useful. The mesh will select the entire mesh. Now I have these cut into separate pieces as I exported them out in Maya. This is kind of like a paint bucket tool 
for anything that's connected. So if I were to go and do these individually, it would work like so. I use the UV chunk fill most often. So I can go through and start to just get these started. And I'm just using this kind of a base color that I set up on everything. All my, my basic mid-tones are what I want to work with here. And this, of course, is just filling this from all of my UVs that I've had selected here. Oops, we don't want to get that whole piece. So this instance, this is where I want to go in and do the polygon fill. Okay, and because my UVs are stacked, this will also do the same to the back. Saves me a little time there. Something else I like to do is the material view. If I were rendering out a PBR project, a physical based rendering lighting project, this is a helpful view because it shows my material I've got here. There's a little reflection in here. I can go in and I can, I can paint height. I can paint all kinds of different things. And the material view shows this off. I'm not going to be using this. So I tend to paint in base color, which gives me a flat color view of what I'm doing. It also is a little bit easier to see. Even if I was working in PBR, sometimes I'll go and paint in base color and then preview it in the material view. So then I'll just go along, continuing to select all of what needs to be added to the color sets. So again, I'm going to be exporting out my base color, my diffuse layer. So this is essentially what I'm going to be seeing in my base color map is something just like this. And again, the difference between just painting a diffuse versus PBR is I'm using no lighting information that would be generated from wherever I'm going to be rendering this, whether that be in a, an individual renderer or in a, a game engine or even in Maya. So I'm just going to continue to work with this same single, single texture. Now, just like in Photoshop, Sometimes you get a lot of people asking, well, what brush did you use? And what brush is this? And truly, I think the best thing to do is really just start to kind of experiment with these brushes. Just click on them, pick a layer, and just start playing with it. Just see what happens. You know, go in and kind of try to emulate the style that you're looking at and grab your brush that works with that. So I'm going to actually be painting on the black mask itself and then go back over here to my actual brush. This is where, again, seeing this uh, center line would be nice. So I'll go to my display settings. Turn this on, back to my layers. So then I'll select a brush and I'll just kind of start to just work with it and see if it starts to kind of fit the concept art and see if this is what I want it to do. So I highly recommend just exploring, just, just kind of test your brushes. Now also with these brushes, if I go over here to my properties, I can scroll down and this is where I can adjust things like the brush size, the flow, the stroke opacity, the spacing, how often it will actually stamp out each one of these little uh, brush images, I guess, if that makes sense. We can adjust our size jitter, flow jitter, angle jitter, position jitter. Size jitter, for example, right now it's set to 100%. So that means all of the size, all of the jitter is just all to one size. If I go and bring this down, it will now change how it stamps these out. It'll do big and little pieces. Flow will do the same thing. So if you grab a different brush, see it changes that flow. Angle jitter, maybe we get a brush like uh, something more non-uniform. As you can see right above here, it will change whether it's very uniform or rotate the angle of how this is stamped out. Now, something else that I find to be extremely helpful is there is a keyboard shortcut helper. So if I hold down control, it will show all of the hotkeys that I can use with control. Same with shift. Same with Alt. This works on both panels. Now, this is being covered up by my concept art over here. You just hold it down for just a second, and this starts to show up. If this doesn't come up right away, then you can go to Edit, Settings. If you'd like to show the keyboard helper shortcuts, make sure this is checked. Hold down your modifier keys, like Shift, Control, or Alt, and it will show these options, and this can help you with learning these shortcuts. All right, we should also talk about painting with symmetry. This little button up here will draw a line down the middle. And now, however I paint, it will actually make this symmetrical and it'll paint on both sides, which is, which is a nice time-saving feature. Now I can also adjust my blend layers just like in Photoshop. So I've got normal, pass through, multiply, divide, all of these options in here. I typically start with normal and then we'll adjust them as needed. So if I wanted to paint the I don't know, say we'll add the little bit on the shadow in here. 
Control, right click, we'll change the brush size. So say we go in and paint this over here, add a little bit of this in here, and maybe we'll drop a little highlight in over here. And if I wanted to go in and change this to pass through, replace, multiply, I can work with those over here. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, I should also go and save my project. I'm just going to do save as. Again, see PRF stands on top of every other thing, which is great. Now, I typically like to name my projects what they are, in this case, dagger, and then substance, but then I will also name it underscore 001. Every time that I sit down to work on this project, I will then open it and immediately rename it to dagger substance underscore 002 and so on. That way, if something happens with my file, it corrupts whatever, I have a bit of backup. Now, Substance Painter also does have an autosave feature, but I like to save in iterations as well, just to make sure I've got my bases covered. Now, when I'm painting, if I'm just painting straight as is, my colors tend to just come out very, very bold. There's no blending happening here. Now, I do have the pressure sensitivity with my pen, which is fantastic. However, if I wanted to paint and get some more blending as I paint, I can work with the stroke opacity and the flow. The difference between these two can be a little bit confusing, but stroke opacity stays the same opacity no matter how many times I go over that same area. Unless I lift my brush up and come back down. Then I can layer and build from there. Flow, on the other hand, if I start to paint, I can slowly build up certain areas by going over it without lifting my brush up. And if I were to drop the flow way down, you can really see this. So if I kind of wanted to build up something, it's much easier to build up a gradient using flow. So I use both of those quite often. I use flow more often than stroke opacity. Another quick tool is the lazy mouse. I can turn this on by hitting the D key or this little button up here, up by distance. Let's get rid of some of these. And based on the diameter of this gray circle around my brush, it's not gonna start painting until it leaves that circle. And that's what this distance is. I can make this smaller, or I can make this larger. And that just determines how far behind the brush the line will actually flow. Now another feature that's kind of handy to work with is the smudge brush. So if I were to paint something, I don't know, so we'll paint something dark, we'll paint something light on top, and I go over here to this smudge, this will actually blend the two together. Now really, because I'm painting on separate layers, it only affects this top layer, but it will smudge it and blend it with that bottom layer so this is another way that I can get kind of a hand-painted look, a hand-painted style, by pushing and pulling this paint and this color. So again, it works in layers. And if I decided to use an eyedropper tool and work on a single layer, I could paint as if I were painting a little painting. But my favorite feature about digital technology is the undo button. So I like to use layers just for a non-destructive workflow. But this, uh, this smudge brush is, is, is quite handy. And as you push it, it, it gives a pretty decently realistic effect. Now, the other thing that I use to blend, sounds pretty obvious, but is the eraser tool. As I start to paint something, I'll go in and I'll use the eraser. And I'll often use the flow, and I'll bring that down quite low. And I'll layer how I erase something. And this I can give, this gives me a blended look with a little more control as well. I can go to the eraser icon over here, or if I'm just on my actual brush, when I see this white on the sphere over here, it tells me that I am painting. Now, if I hit the X key, as in X-ray, it will flip this to black, and that will take this away. Again, this works with the flow. So I can work in that method as well. Now, another very important feature that we need to discuss here is down over here under my paint properties. If I scroll down a little bit past all the different jitters, under alignment, there's a drop down with these options here. Tangent wrap comes default. And what tangent wrap is really good at 
is painting across the UV seam. Now right over here, I have a seam. And I can paint right, I can paint right across this pretty easily. Let's use a different brush to show this a little bit better. I can paint across this quite well. It covers that UV seam really, really quite well. Now if I go to UV and I paint across this, this does not seam over very well at all. And you'd wonder why would I ever want to use UV? I just always use tangent wrap. Well, the beautiful part about the UV is if I'm painting on something that I don't want to go on to the rest of the model, say we'll look at the, I don't know, maybe the, let's do the gold over here. And if I were painting on this, and I were adding kind of a nice little shadow in here, do you see how it's not painting on this other part over here? It's not painting on the actual silver unless I really pull the brush over. If I were on tangent wrap and I were painting here, it just goes right on to the next piece, which can be handy if I wanted to translate that over, but I don't want this color to go on that other piece over here. So I will go to UV and it will keep that separate. Now also, if I am painting on my in my UV space, and say I wanted something to translate from one piece to the next, right? I want maybe, we'll go down over here. I want to paint across the seam with a seamless paint. I would use tangent wrap. And even if I'm painting over here and I'm painting this edge, it actually does a pretty good job of catching that, that seam. However, if I don't want this to happen, I can go to UV and paint on this. We'll undo it because that's painting from the other side. If I don't want this to paint over, I go to UV, and no matter how far over past this I go, it does not paint onto that next UV shell. So this is again why your UV layout is quite important and how tangent wrap and UV painting spaces on the alignment can make a huge difference and what's going on. So say if I were working on my jewel up here, and maybe we'll do the, let's do the shadow. Now it starts default on tangent wrap, and I really don't want that to have to show up on this other piece all the time. And if this does happen, an easy way to get rid of this is go over to the polygon fill, and then put this to, turn this to black. And now if I've got my UV chunk selected, I can now just select that UV chunk so we'll do it again over here. I can select that UV chunk and it removes the color from that area. The other way to do this is to not have it happen in the first place. So we'll go back to UV and I will paint on this and it doesn't transfer over unless I really carry it over and then it, and then it can do that. Now this can be a little bit of a strange concept to wrap your brain around. My best advice would be to just test it. Everything does start with tangent wrap, but if something's not painting like you want it to, switch it over to, to UV space. Now, you can also do camera and tangent planer. I don't really use those much. They do have their own individual features, but I really just go between these two just to keep my life simple. All right, so there is kind of a basic overview of some of the methodologies. And usually when I bring this down, I like to have my alignment, have this tangent wrap showing just a little bit down here. Just that way I can go and change that, but I still have more of a view of my layers over here. And again, your layer stack works like Photoshop, so it cascades down. So as you may have noticed over here, the layers on top will paint on top of what's below them, right? And if I were to move this around, it literally just waterfalls down below it. So I typically work to where the shadows are on the bottom and I work lighter going up on top. That way I can layer my highlights on top of my shadows. All right, now let's get some painting done. Well, as far as our tour of Substance Painter, that's about the bare bones of it. I'll see you in part two in the next video.